Hello, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 today. It's often called the faith chapter. It fits into the overall, overall argument of Hebrews so well because it talks about that men of the first covenant, though they had great belief in the promises of God, did not fully receive all that God promised. And remember now we're in a comparison between the two covenants. Here are men of faith that did not receive under the old covenant, uh, but they're going to receive under the covenant of Jesus. And so it's a continuing comparison between the superiority of the covenant and Jesus Christ. Now, this particular uh, account is going to go back in the Old Testament and run through some lives and events of Old Testament uh, characters. And it's going to say that some of them are going to have faith and be successful, and some are going to have faith and die. And so just because the historical circumstance of their life has nothing to do with the promises of God, and that's what I think it's talking about. Let's, let's go through here, and uh, many of these will uh, be so familiar to you. Now, faith is the assurance of things we hope for and the proof of the reality of things we cannot see. Now, this is not really a theological definition of the Hebrew term or Greek term faith. It is a way of comparing these two covenants. These men in the Old Testament believed, though they never got the full promise of God. Uh, that's the idea here. Now, the word faith, in the Old Testament, it's the word amen and its derivatives. And the basic etymology is to be firm or to be sure. Remember that, biblically speaking, it is not the degree of our faith. It is the object of our faith that's so significant. Because faith the side of a mustard seed can move mountains. Uh, it's not so much the size of the faith we have or the degree. It is who we focus our faith on. So the primary focus of the Old Testament is the faithfulness of God. I've done a tape on that called What is Faith? And I hope you'll send for our free catalog of tapes because I think we've misdefined it in modern America. Uh, faith is primarily God's trustworthiness that we respond to. It does not focus in us. It focuses in God. And it doesn't end there. The faithful God wants to make us faithful like himself. And there's the flow uh, of biblical uh, justification, sanctification. Now, uh, the word faith is going to be used so often through here, it is exactly the opposite of apostasy, which we've been talking about in chapters 6 and 10. Exactly the opposite, okay? Now, when it says the assurance of, the word assurance here, we found in the papyri, which of course is the garbage dumps in Egypt, that this word can mean title deed. Uh, it's used very similar to Paul's uh, concept of the sealing of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1.14 and 2 Corinthians 1.22 and 5.5. 5. The idea that we have the down payment or the earnest money already of the promises of God in Jesus Christ. Now this word assurance is used three times in Hebrews. In chapter 1 verse 3, it's used in the sense that King James translated here the substance of things unseen, the ground, if you please, the underpinnings. Um, it's the, the basic etymology of this word is to place anything under. And in 1.3, it's the sense of foundation or nature or reality. But now the same word is used in 3.14 where it's translated assurance or confidence. And that's the way it's used in this verse. By faith, okay, in the faithfulness of God, we know we know the truth, our reality, and yet we haven't fully realized it or seen it yet, okay? Now, the word hope is used in the New Testament, not in the sense of maybe, could be, possibly, as it is in English, but it's the confidence of God bringing to fruition that which he promised, but with the ambiguous time element. In the New Testament, it's usually used for the second coming. Here, it's used for Old Testament promises, okay? For the proof, and this is the word proof by means of a test, of the reality of things we cannot see. Now, these people looked forward to God's promises, though quite often in their life they did not see them brought to uh, completion or fruition. Verse 2, for it, for it is the men of old won a, God's approval. How? By faith we understand that the worlds were created. Now, Notice it says uh, the worlds, this is the word eons, ages. It speaks of both physical and uh, spiritual reality, 
Okay, so all that has been created, Colossians says, the visible and invisible was created by the Son. Now, the word created here really means prepared, um, beautifully coordinated. This is the word were framed. The earth is the backdrop of God's love affair with man. The earth and all of the created universe is simply the, the frame in which the focus of God's relationship with man uh, takes place. And it's perfect passive, by the way. And now exists at God's command. Now, at God's command, this is not the word logos, which focuses on the, on the person of Christ. This is the word rhema, which goes back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and is the power of the spoken word. God spoke and things that did not exist came into being. Now, this is exactly different from the Gnostic view that matter and spirit are co-eternal. And so it's a little slap at that Greek philosophy, and most of the cosmologies of the ancient world would posit the pre-existence of matter. Now, here we have, by the spoken word, and you might want to see uh, Isaiah 55, 10 through 12, the power of the spoken word. So things that we did not see develop out of... Uh, mere matter. Now this, we would call this fiat, would be God spoke creation existence, and out of nothing we would call by the Latin phrase ex nihilo, out of nothing. You might want to see Psalms 33, 6, and 9 for the power of the spoken word, out of nothing. That's the idea here. Okay, verse 4, by faith Abel. Now Abel is in Genesis chapter 4, and of course it's the story of Cain and Abel, all right? offered a sacrifice more acceptable to God than Cain did. Now, I don't think it's the idea that uh, uh, Cain offered a sacrifice from the field and Abel offered a sacrifice from the flock, the difference being the idea of blood. Uh, that's not the inference here. It's the faith behind the act that's the key, not the offering itself. And I want to say to you, I think one of the most true uh, isms in the area of biblical faith is that it's God looks at the heart before God looked at the act. And so it's the faith attitude of Abel that made it pleasing to God. Notice it continues when it says, For by it he was approved as an upright man, since God approved him for the offering he made, and by it he still continues to speak though dead. Now this is the idea of Abel's blood crying from the ground. You might want to see Genesis 4, 18, Hebrews 12, 24. He offered a sacrifice to God in the fullness of heart's love and faith. And Abel offered it in, uh, in a sense of being manipulated into have to. And that made all the difference in the world. Cain was the one that was unapproved. Abel's the one uh, that was approved. Now, verse 5. By faith Enoch, that is Genesis 5, 24. Now, mine says was transplanted from earth. Now, the Greek word here means move to another spot. It's aorist passive. It's used three times through here. So he was taken from this realm to another realm. We often feel like he was taken to heaven like Elijah without dying. The only two people we know uh, ever did that. Now, so he did not experience dying and he could not be found because God had transplanted him from the earth. For before he was transplanted from the earth, evidence was given him that he pleased God. Now you might think, well, my, my Old Testament says he walked with God. Well, now, this author is quoting the Septuagint, and in the Septuagint, it does not have walked with God. It has the very similar phrase, well-pleasing to God. And so this author is quoting the Septuagint, as most of the New Testament authors do. Okay, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, this is that strong term, impossible, used in chapter 6, verse 4, and chapter 6, verse 18. It can't mean hard or difficult. It means impossible. God has chosen to limit himself in his relationship to man based on man's faith response. Now, that doesn't mean God couldn't do it another way. It means God chose to always initiate, but that man must respond. Now, faith is that trusting response to the promises of God. That's why I think biblical faith is one kind of unit. That's why Paul in Romans 4 can go back to Abraham for the basis of justification by faith, all right? For anyone who approaches God must, dia, moral necessity, believe that there is a God and that he gives rewards to all who earnestly try to find him. Now, two things I want to say. The word faith and the word believe and the word trust are three English words with one Greek root. The noun pistis, the, word, the verb pistuo. Now, we can't catch the essence of biblical uh, faith 
in wanting this word. It's faith, it's belief, and it's trust. It primarily focuses our response to God's trustworthiness. It's not only mental assent, it's not only emotional response, though both of those are involved. It is primarily volitional trusting, a transfer of our trust from ourselves into God and what he has done and what he has promised and what he will and has performed, okay? Now it says he gives rewards to those who earnestly try to find him. I must say to you here that this is one aspect of man's response. But biblically speaking, no one searches after God. The Old Testament phrase is, uh, like sheep, all of us have gone astray and no one is sought after God. God, biblically speaking, is always seeking after us. John 6, 44 and 65. We only respond to God's initiating love, okay? We love because he first loved us. would be 1 John 4, uh, 10, I believe is where that is. Now, verse 7. By faith Noah, Genesis 6 through 8 on being divinely warned about things not yet seen. God said, build a boat, it's going to flood the whole earth. Now, that was a ridiculous thing to believe, and yet Noah took God at his word without the evidence of what God's saying yet being evident. And that's the idea of faith, okay? Taking God at his word. Uh, in reverence, fear, reverence, prepared a chest. Now, the ark is very much like a chest. It, it just kind of floated in the water. It wasn't a boat, as we know. It was a low, it wrote deep in the water, and the waves would wash over the top. It was a low chest or box for saving his family. And by faith condemned the world and became the possessor of uprightness that results from faith. That's the same emphasis as Paul is making in Romans chapter 4, that he believed God even though it didn't seem right what God said. Okay? Uh, by faith, Abraham, Genesis 12 through 22, where all these promises are mentioned over and over, on being called. Notice the ideal of God's initiating. Just like he spoke to Noah, he called Abraham. Obeying and starting off for a country which he was to receive as his own, and he did it in spite of the fact that he did not know where he was going. Now, this author sometimes... Uh, uh, <laughs> What word should I use? He makes the Old Testament characters look like great men of faith. If you go back and read the story, they're turkeys just like us. God said, leave your relatives. Abraham took his relatives with him. And so these old men are not great men of faith. They're just men who have trusted in God with all their faults and failures. But that, that relates to me. I can understand these men because their warts show in the Old Testament. And they still were counted as righteous because they trusted in God. Now notice again it says in verse 9, by faith he made his temporary home in the land. This is the word sojourner. It means someone who is a non-citizen. They have no rights. And though he owned this country, this area, because God promised it, he lived as a sojourner in it. He had no rights in his own country. And so that's the ideal of faith. He, there was a promise and he believed it, though he never saw the fruition of it. Okay? Uh, lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Look at verse 10. For he was confidently looking for that city. And this idea of a city is used quite often in the Bible to describe God's uh, future place for man. It's used in Hebrews 12, 22, Hebrews 13, 14, Galatians 4, 26, and ultimately the book of Revelation, Revelation 3, 12, and 21, 2, as the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven is that special city that God's prepared with the solid foundations whose architect and builder is God. This is another slap at Gnosticism because they didn't believe that spiritual God could touch sinful matter. And yet here the author says, God made this city. And there's another uh, attack on this Gnostic false teaching. By faith, Sarah. Now, again, you know that both Abraham and Sarah laughed at God's promises. Abraham in Genesis 17, 17. Sarah in Genesis 18, 12. They had unbelief, and yet they did trust. Ultimately, though they initially laughed at it, they did receive it and believe it. Though they tried some ridiculous ways to get it fulfilled. Abraham, uh, Sarah, now P46 and D have the word barren connected with Sarah, and that's true, though I'm not sure it's uh, original. Receive strength to become pregnant. Unusual word here, usually used for men impregnating somebody, but here used of Sarah. And actually gave birth to a child, though she was past time for it. You see, God said something, didn't look like it was going to happen, but they trusted God in what he said, and there's where the righteousness comes from. So they sprang from one man, though dead, and his offspring were as numbers of the stars. You'll see Genesis 15, 5, 22, 17, 32, 12. From one man who looked like he couldn't have any children, a huge nation came. They believed God. Now, in verse 13 and following is the idea of, of more people and more of a summary form. These people all died victoriously as a result of their faith, although they did not receive the blessing 
a promise. You might want to see verse 39 of this chapter. They believed God, though they didn't always see the complete fulfillment of all that God promised. That is because they uh, really saw them in the far-off future and welcomed them. I've often heard that the Old Testament people look forward to the Messiah and the New Testament people look back to the Messiah. That sounds good. It's just not biblical. These folks were not looking for the Messiah necessarily. They were looking for the promises of God, whether it's a large nation or a promised land or whatever. Okay? They took God at his word. They responded with the best life they had in their day by faith. And so professed to be only strangers and sojourners here on earth. Now, this is the Septuagint of Genesis 23, 4 and, and Psalms 39, 12. That this, that song, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through, that's the reality here. We don't, we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven, and we believe that by faith, though right now we don't see that fully. Uh, notice verse 15, if, second class, potential action. Um, let's see. This is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. This refers to Genesis 3, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Though those men had faults, God still said, I, they're my men. For he uh, has prepared for them a city. Now, we'll see Revelation 21. Hallelujah. John 14, 2. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come and receive you. My father's house are many mansions. That's the idea of that city. By faith, Abraham was put to the test. This is a perfect, uh, excuse me, present passive. It's the word to test with a view toward destruction. It refers to Genesis 22, 1. Yet James chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 says that God tests no one. And, but the Lord's Prayer says, lead me not into temptation. What's the deal? There are two words for test in Greek. One means to test with a view toward destruction. One means to test with a view toward approval. God tests to strengthen our faith. God does not test us to destroy us. We must remember that distinction. He offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, this next, next few verses, we must realize, is a, is a play on the life of Abraham. Uh, sometimes people say that Paul and, and James disagree. That's not true. Paul uses Abraham when he first believed God and left uh, his city, okay? And James picks up on when Abraham later, many years later, offered Isaac on the altar. And so it, it, it's not faith or works. It's always been faith and works. You might want to read Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Now, not just 8 and 9 as we usually quote, but 8 through 10. It's faith and works, always. God saved us in faith to make us faithful people. Christ's likeness is the goal of salvation. Now, uh, let's see. There's a quote here in the last part of 18 from Genesis 21, 12. You might want to see as the background of Abraham offering Isaac. For he considered the fact that God was able to raise people from the dead. Abraham didn't know how God was going to do it. But in Genesis 22, 5, he told the, the servants, we will return to you. So he knew he was going to offer Isaac, and yet he believed God would work it out some way. And so he believed that. Uh, let's see, verse 20. By faith, Isaac put his blessings in the future on Jacob. This is Genesis 27, 27 and following. Then in, by faith, Jacob, he blessed his, uh, uh, Joseph's children, Ephraim and Manasseh. We see that in Genesis 48, 14. Um, let's see. Now notice the latter part of verse 21. Leaning on the top of his staff. Well, the top of his staff is very close to the word bed. And because, let's see, of Genesis 47, 31 and 1 Kings 1, 47, I believe it should be on his bed, not on his staff. There's been some ridiculous renderings of this Hebrew phrase. The Vulgate says that Jacob worshipped Joseph's staff. What a terrible translation. I think on his bed he gave a patriarchal blessing as the other patriarchs had. Uh, notice a bit about what he had to do with his body, the last of 22. Uh, both Joseph and uh, Jacob said, don't leave me here. Take me to the promised land. And, of course, the Hebrews, when they went in the Exodus, took the bones of Joseph and Jacob. By faith, Moses at his birth was uh, hidden for three months by his parents. Now, the Masoretic text says his mother, but the Septuagint says his parents. This is Exodus 2. That's what's quoted. It deals with Moses, several verses here. Verse 24, by faith, when he had grown up, he refused Arist middle to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's a technical term for someone in line with, for the throne. Moses may have been Pharaoh of Egypt, but he chose to suffer with the Hebrews in, in a promise not yet seen than take all the glories of Egypt that were seen. There's the idea. Um, let's see. It says a passing enjoyment of sin. The Bible does say it say there's pleasure in sin for a season. Notice in verse 27 where it mentions by faith he left Egypt because he was not afraid of the king's anger. Well, you read Exodus 2, 14 and 15, he was afraid of the king's anger is why he led. So we're, we're kind of uh, dramatizing the Old Testament accounts, but the, the truth is the warts show. This is not the Exodus. This is him fleeing after killing the Egyptian. Um, 
as though they were actually seeing him who is unseen. Uh, Moses chose God's kingdom over Pharaoh's kingdom whom he could see. Verse 28, by faith he instituted the Passover and the pouring of blood in the doorpost. So the destroyer, God told him that death angel's coming. Uh, Moses believed him and took the lambs and put the blood on there. Even though he hadn't seen the death angel yet, he believed God and the, the uh, land of Goshen was saved because of the blood on the doorpost and lentil. Let's see. The destroying angel, this deal with the grim reaper who just comes and takes men in the scrim. That's not true. The destroying angel here who the rabbis call Samuel is mentioned several times in the Bible, and he is a servant of the Most High God. Exodus 12, 23, 2 Samuel 24, 16, and 17. By faith they crossed the Red Sea, Exodus 14. This is the Reed Sea, Yom Suf. I think it's to the north, close to the Mediterranean, instead of the Red Sea as we know today. It's the Reed Sea everywhere it appears in the Old Testament. Uh, though dry land, remember the, the wind blew all night, the east wind, to dry the ground for them? The Egyptians were drowned. Now, I think they were drowned, but the miracle was they were drowned in such shallow water. <laughs> it was a marshy area, not a real deep place. Verse 30, the walls of Jericho collapsed, Joshua 6. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. That was a dumb way to do it. Walk around the city seven days and blow the trumpets. I bet all of them said, we've never done it that way before. And Joshua said, just do it. And they believed and did, and God collapsed the walls. Rahab, the Gentile prostitute in, in verse 50, uh, 31. Wow. What, somebody to believe. The power of faith is so great that a, 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 a Gentile prostitute can be such a prominent figure. You might want well to see James 2, 25. Now, in verse 32 and following. So why should I continue to mention more? For time would fail me. Then he mentions the judges. He mentions Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. They're a little out of order, but you can see them in your notes where they come. Who by faith conquered kingdom, administered justice, new promises, shut the lion's mouth. Sounds like maybe Samson that killed with the honey and all, or David that killed the lions, or maybe Daniel. We're just not sure. Stop the force of fire. Sounds like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of Daniel chapter 3. Escape from dying by the sword. Out of weakness found great strength. See 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul's thorn in the flesh is an illusion to the same truth. Grew mighty in war. Put foreign armies to flight. Okay, there's some victories these men had. Notice women by resurrection received the dead again. That might be Elisha and Elijah's, Elijah and Elisha's work. 1 Kings 17, 23, 2 Kings 4, 17. But notice there's, all, there's a positive side. They were victorious. But here's the negative side. Still men of faith. Notice. Um, they endured tortures. Um, they uh, had a test and taunts and tortures, even chains and prisons. Some were stoned to death. Now, tradition says Jeremiah was stoned to death. We know that Zechariah was stoned to death. Uh, and that's not the prophet you know, but another man, Second Chronicles 24, 20, and 21. They were tortured to death. Man, but tough. They were lived by faith, but they died. They were sawn in two. Now, tradition says Isaiah was killed this way. Now, in King James it has, were, uh, they were tempted. But they were tempted is, is not in the Chester Beatty papyri. And really, it's very similar to the little phrase, sawn in two. And some think a copyist has got those mixed up. They were killed by the sword. You might want to see Jeremiah 26, 23, 1 Kings 19, 10. So all of these people, some looked like they were so successful, they lived by faith. Some like they were so defeated, they lived by faith. They trusted the promises of God, irregardless of uh, historical circumstances. And God counted to them as righteousness. Now, the last two verses. So all these people, by their faith, won God's approval, yet none of them received what he had promised. Now, what does that mean? Well, they did not fully receive the promise of God. This is a rabbinical argument saying that God was promising a new day, a new fellowship, a new uh, a, a, a place to be with him. Now, they received some of the promises because some were successful and won battles, but some died. And what it, it goes with this old idea that God's promises have not fully been received in the Old Covenant, but they are fully received in Jesus Christ. These Old Testament people believed by faith, and God it counted them as righteousness. Now, he's warning these recipients of the letter, you must move into the full promises of God, even though you can't see it in your own life. All you see is persecution to the church and safety in the synagogue, and you hate to break your traditional hold with your Jewish friends, but you must move out by faith into that which you cannot see. And that's the way God fully accepts you when you act on his promises in faith. And that's the whole argument through here. 
Verse 40, For God had provided something still better for us, that they apart from us might not attain perfection. I want to say a shocking to you. As much as these great men of faith, this is the call, the roll call of faith in the Old Testament, as great and successful of men as they were, they do not understand nor know when they lived as much as you and I do under the new covenant about the plan and purpose of God. Think about that. We know more about God. We have a more intimate fellowship with God than anybody in the Old Testament. And so we're encouraged to move into the fullness of that and act on what we know is the truth here. Remember when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist? He had the greatest man, born of woman, and yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Do you catch the superiority of the new covenant, the new revelation in Jesus Christ versus the old covenant and the revelation through Moses? That's been the argument all the way through here. So in chapter 12, he's going to say, now because you have these great men as an example, because you, because you see how they lived in an inferior covenant, move on, church. Come out, church. Be what you can be, church. Live to the fullness of the new promises of God, the new revelation, the fuller uh, understanding. And it's an admonition to move forward. And it's a beautiful chapter. These men were men. They had problems. They had sin. They often didn't believe as much as we wish they would have believed. But God accepted them because they did act on his word. God is the key. His promises are the key. And the promises in Jesus are superior.